Ho, 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 and a Merry Christmas to you all. What better way to spend the holidays than chilling with the villain? <laughs> yes, of course, today is our Christmas special of chilling with the villain. And we have a very special episode today because we are, in fact, reviewing the Iron Claw movie Myself, the villain Marty Skell, and the producer of the show, Samuel Scott, just got back, well, actually, it was last night, from viewing the Iron Claw movie, and today we're going to review it. So not a classic pay-per-view review, but a very contemporary film, but about a very classic era of professional wrestling. Also, we, we so we've done this on the, we've seen the film on the... 21st 21st we're recording now on the 22nd and hopefully you're listening to this very soon we're going to try and bust this episode out so we could be one of the first reviews of the iron claw movie i also don't think that people were we we're scheduled for mondays and it's christmas on monday and we just want to get it out for people who might otherwise be busy i say might otherwise be busy like it's just like a thing i'm just, we're talking about christmas <laughs> day here. yeah so you know just to get them it's it's our early, it's a Christmas present. It's our Christmas gift. Exactly. It is, and somehow we were fortunate enough. So the official release for the Iron yeah. Claw movie came out on the twenty second. We managed yeah. to see it on the twenty first. Uh, just want to shout out to my pals David Natman and uh, Magnum McLaren who hooked us up and invited us to go watch the movie with them a day early. So David is one of my favorite promoters from Canada. So thank you so much, David, for hooking us up. That was awesome. Yeah, it was um, an awesome evening. I, Thanks, guys. I, it was. And you know what? It's been quite a while to have actually been to the movie theatre. <laughs> yeah, the last I time the I world. yeah, the last time I went was I think for Barbie. That was like in the summer. <laughs> I've been really? twice this year, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, I think just before we get into the review, this is a movie that, you know, both of us, it's surprising to you as well have been looking forward to mm. for quite some time now. And I feel like the anticipation has been, it's been building. I mean, it's not too often that a big motion picture comes out sort of based on professional wrestling. And I mean, when was the last one? We discussed this before, like maybe fighting with our family or the well, wrestler. I said, I said the wrestler and I right. got flamed in the comments, but I yeah. meant like a serious kind of contender movie. Of right. course, there's been ones afterwards. So sorry, producers of fighting with my family. <laughs> right. By the way, I have to ask, if you weren't wearing glasses, would you just say movie or film? And now you've put glasses on, you go motion picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've just started reading again. So maybe I'm, I'm oh, increasing okay. my vocabulary. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, but it, it does seem like maybe once every 10 years, a movie comes out like based around wrestling, it seems. Yeah. So, yeah, this is it for another 10 years now. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to review this. We're a classic wrestling review podcast. This is not a class. You know, will this movie become a classic? That's what we're going to find out. This festive feel-good hit, The Iron Claw. We're going to we're gonna explore it today. And I'm looking forward to this. Well, it, format. yeah. I mean, I don't think we need to get into who directed it and everything else. I know this has been in the works for, like, seven eight years or so yeah. so it's been building up but yeah so we're going to get into the review uh just bear in mind of course yeah. there's going to be spoilers absolutely so if you don't want to be spoiled uh you want to stop the podcast now go watch the movie go see then it come back and, and then re resume yeah, yeah that's what we, we recommend we will be going into spoilers though i so. feel like this is the perfect companion piece to the movie the start of this movie yeah you kind of took me off guard. I actually think the start of this movie was one of the strongest scenes in the whole thing. We see a black and white wrestling arena and we see Fritz von Eric. We just see a close up of his face and he's kind of grunting while he's, it seems like while he's stomping someone's head in. And of course it goes into the kind of famous iconic claw, the iron claw on his opponent. And we see, Fritz for an Eric celebrate and that's kind of the start of the movie um obviously the movie there's obviously a lot of things that the movie kind of either left out or choose to you know chose to ignore that's obviously very typical of 
these sort of movies. One thing I did think was quite interesting, they did not refer whatsoever with Fritz von Erich because the gimmick of Fritz von Erich was that he was he was a heel and he was essentially a Nazi <laughs> was his gimmick. And that's right. where Fritz von Erich from. In this movie, they tried to suggest that he got the name from like, I want to say an auntie or something they they seem to suggest um obviously that wasn't the case but they don't they they definitely portray fritz as being a big star but completely ignore the fact that he was a, a nazi doing a nazi gimmick didn't he also have a fake nazi brother yeah. i think he did right waldo i can't remember from, his name yeah waldo von eric i want to say yeah yeah so <laughs> well they were a tag team i think they broke up because fritz didn't want to travel to the east coast or anything he just kind of wanted to stay where he was at and i guess after a while he ended up you know purchasing or getting into the office at least on the dallas territory but they, they start with this opening scene which was pretty artistic and i quite enjoyed it and then that goes i from my memory co- correct me unfortunately there's no like breakdown yet on the internet because the movie just came out today um but then it goes into kind of a full color picture and we yeah. see sort of what's supposed to be at the time, like modern times of the uh, the Von Erich brothers wrestling. In fact, it's just one of them, right? I think it's just Kevin and he's wrestling the Sheik. I'm not sure if that's supposed to be the actual Sheik or just like a generic sort of Sheik character. And it was funny, the whole time I was watching it, I was like, because they shoot it really well. And I was like, is that Chavo Guerrero? I think that's yeah. Chavo. I think it's Chavo. And I knew, I nearly asked you in the movie theater, but I didn't want to be that guy sort of talking all the time especially as the movie just started. But uh, I looked it up and it was Chavo. So um, I was correct. But they shoot it really well, but you can't really tell whatsoever. Yeah. So the beginning of the movie, like you said, is a flashback. It's in black and white. The parts in the ring, I thought, looked really good and very artistically done. But him after his match, he goes out into the parking lot with his wife and they have a back and forth. And I really thought that kind of those shots still in black and white were just very flat and it kind of looked really student And I also felt like the dialogue was as well. And I was, for me, a very kind of rough start. I was like, oh no. But that was over in a couple of minutes. And actually when they brought in the color, you know, they fast forwarded to current times, which was still back then for us. The rest of the movie I thought looked really good. They they lean they obviously lent into the whole nostalgia and period piece kind of visuals of it, but I feel like for this sort of thing it wasn't obnoxious. You had to do it and they mm. did it very very well. In fact, like some of the shots actually almost looked like Technicolor, like the film that they mm. would have used back in the time. And I just wanted to say like their attention to detail to the period. I I I'm I'm sure there'll be some people or some reviews where they'll be like, "Oh, they're just leaning into nostalgia and it's just nostalgia point and everything, but I actually thought it was incredibly well done. What well, about I, you? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was an interesting use, um, you know, showing the sort of Fritz uh, era, which would have been what back in the fifties, I guess, in black and white. I thought that was a good way to establish, because you know, because obviously, I know the wrestling history, but the majority of people mm. watching this movie probably don't. So I thought it was a good way to kind of show, okay, this was yesteryear and this is today. So I did think that was quite a good use of colors like i guess he does the match we see him sat backstage i think he's got a towel wrapped around him and then he comes out of the building and he's greeted by his wife and his children which is the first time we see the von eric brothers and you know they're basically kids at the time kids yeah and uh the scene i did think it was funny so he shows he surprises his wife doris i believe her name is yeah. Uh, with a new car was it a cadillac or something something nice right yeah it's really flashy and nice and they clearly can't afford it because he's hitched it to the back of the trailer that they're living in <laughs> right, right so you've got that kind of there's there's his real life which is the trailer and then there's the life that he wants to portray as a star which is the cadillac and so it's like a visual kind of metaphor and i thought that was pretty well done and pretty funny they spelled it out for you as well because yeah. she doris moan is like oh we can't afford this and he says, you know, oh, I've been told if I want to be a star, I've got to present myself like a star, yep. which I thought was kind of kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, but you visually got that before they even opened their mouths. As soon as you see it, that was very nicely presented. Got to say, uh, the mum and the dad, probably the best actors in the in the film. So straight away, like out the gate, pretty, pretty good job, right? So we're, well, I assume we're going to discuss it a lot, the different characters, but I did think that fritz which was played by how do you pronounce his name holt McCallany. oh holt McCallany, yeah. yeah yeah i thought Mind fritz Hunter. was the most spot on out of them all like fritz you could really 
you could really see Fritz von. You could kind of forget that it was a movie, and you actually think they were looking at Fritz von Eric. Okay, didn't, cool. No spoilers, or what I'm about to say, but I didn't really get that from any of the other characters. But Fritz, I we'll did get into for that. sure. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. did for sure. I don't need them to like look spot on if no. the acting is good enough. But I've heard a lot of people say that the actor kind of looked and portrayed him incredibly well. Yeah, so I would you say that's probably for you the because you have a lot of knowledge of all these characters, these real life characters. Do you reckon he was the most spot on? I believe so, and I I think Fritz really was the um was star. the star of the show. And on like obviously the film is kind of well it, the the main character in the film it's based around Kevin, but yep. I guess the how would you like the narrative is kind of based around Fritz really. Do you know what I mean? Like the the, the he, whole yeah, narrative. I, I get what you mean. Yeah, he's a he's like a core pillar of the family as the patriarch. So he's also like a core pillar by extension of the the movie and Kevin's like story, right? He's yeah, a central I, character. Yeah. I mean, I think the whole, the whole, the story really is kind of based around sort of how Fritz was hard on his kids and kind of forced them um, into being wrestlers and kind of like, what was the repercussions of that? <laughs> this movie is a family drama. That's what yes. it is. Yeah, at yes. Yeah. Yeah. Were you surprised? I was kind of surprised that there wasn't, um any real uh comedic relief in the movie so you chuckled a little bit at some of the dialogue from fritz and i did as well but it's not comic relief it's almost like darkly funny it's right. i don't know if it's supposed to be funny i think you laugh because it's so uncomfortable just the <laughs> stuff that he says to his own kids so yeah there was no comic relief in this movie but there were some and i feel like it wouldn't just be us there are some kind of chuckle worthy moments i think were well done so he ranks the hierarchy of his favoritism of his own children at the family table while everyone's eating i feel like why it's funny is because you know exactly what character he is from that point onwards you know yes actually that is probably great character moment the line that i laughed most at was early on you see the family so after the wrestling scene so we see Fritz back in the day. Then we see the, the Von Erich brothers, or at least one of them, wrestling the Sheik. Then we see the scene of them, you know, eating breakfast around the family home table. And Fritz says something along the lines of, you know, we all know my favorites. Number one is Kerry. Number Harry. two is Kevin. Number three is David. And number four is Mike. And he said, but that can change at any point or something like that. And yeah, it was I've great. watched and- these documentaries before about the Von Erichs, and that's something that. Kevin talks about how that was like, they all knew who was dad's favorite. And he kind of described it saying like, it wasn't, you know, that makes sound really bad, but like it kind of wasn't, or maybe it helped us to be more competitive or whatever it might be. But just hearing the dad say that I thought, again, it just told you exactly from the get go, what type of character Fritz is and almost kind of what the story is going to be about. Yeah. And in every other movie, including this one, that the shot that we're talking about, the scene, is just one of those character establishing moments. It's the first time we see the rest of the brothers and everyone's on screen at the same nearly everyone is on the screen at the same time, carries away. And normally in movies, everyone will be able to get their bits. You understand every character. And this happens in this scene as well. Yet the father, Fritz, establishes like his dominance over the scene which lets you know his character you know he establishes his dominance over the scene and the the rest of the characters like he doesn't give them like their chance to shine where other movies would just like kind of give people equal weighting and i thought that was kind of very well like as clever direction and i honestly i don't know how popular this will be but i can't tell if you're supposed to know deep down that you shouldn't like the character the dad or if you're supposed to kind of he's almost an anti-hero like i didn't feel any neg over overall negative emotions towards the father and i don't know if that was the writing or the portrayal or the acting or the direction but i kind of liked him <laughs> right right <laughs> like well, he, he's I, not he's not a scumbag like he yes. is warm in his own ways when you see it and you can tell when he's switching on being tough like tough love versus real love and the mum does that as well so like he's not just like an irredeemable scumbag no. dad he really isn't he's really complicated he clearly he clearly loves his boys All very much very much and yeah. um 
he clearly wants what's best for them. He just doesn't sort of conduct it in the best way, I guess. So he, obviously he's flawed as a, as a person, mm-hmm. um, but it's not coming from, like you said, like an evil place or anything else. So I don't necessarily think he's supposed to be like the villain in this no. movie. I don't think, um, I mean, there isn't really a villain as such other than, I guess what they bill as the curse. Um, I will say this. So these opening scenes when it shows the Von Eriks in Dallas wrestling, this is kind of one problem I had with it. And you tell me if you agree or not, maybe I'm wrong, but the Von Eriks in Dallas were, you know, at certain points, like the biggest thing in Dallas, they were essentially like the Beatles or Elvis. They were so red hot, so famous, like, absolutely 100% celebrities. They were teen idols and they constantly have heard so many stories of, you know, them not being able to go anywhere and just women throwing themselves all over them constantly, you know, them. And then like, even in the audience, you know, you watch the videos and you see the reactions that they got from the crowd. And it's not like the crowd cheered. It was like, yay. It was like, I don't know. It's like a, the fans when their team wins the world cup, that was like that for when the Von Erichs were coming to the ring. And, you know, like I've said, watched Kevin Von Erich interviews before and he's saying by the time he got to the ring that he was all cut up and bleeding and stuff because the women were scratching him so yeah, much, yeah. like trying to get hold of him. And yeah, there was, you know, such big stars in Dallas. And I don't know if the movie really portrayed that well enough it does attempt to portray them as big stars but i don't think it doesn't really capture the magnitude of how big a deal the von erics were in in dallas i can't i mostly agree with you yeah i feel like they deliberately downplayed at the start kevin to upplay david for that point in time and mm. spoilerish you know there is a funeral coming soon there's multiple there's a shot like a top-down shot of a funeral procession of David. Uh, we'll get to that. And just like the cars are kind of almost, it's like parting a sea, you know, of people. It's just that, but that's the only real time they, they kind of established visually or even in, even in speech, there's no kind of talk of how popular they are up until that point. And I find that kind of um, not odd because this is going to be two movies. This is, depending on if you're a wrestling fan and you know the story this is going to be a completely different movie to if you're just a you you want to watch some a24 drama oh it's called the ankle i'm going to watch that i feel like the liberty that they took there would work for that latter type of audience that i mentioned but if you know what the Varan erics are or were at that point in time yeah it is kind of odd and it does set you up you kind of takes you out of the movie if you know if you know what they are like because how do I put this, Marty? You're right. There's a scene. At the, there's a scene close to the start. It's Kevin and David are uh, doing like their first match as a tag team, and they're not really swarm. There's a couple of girls waiting for them. They want to speak to Kevin, but they weren't mobbed at all. It was like I've been to shows when you were super young, and there were bigger crowds outside. You know, right? Yeah, it's bizarre. Yeah, yeah. So there was a really weird like dichotomy there. Yeah. Well, I think well, I, the reason why I found it odd as well is because they're obviously in this movie concentrating on their downfall being because of their mm-hmm. relationship with Fritz and how they just, you know, nothing they ever did they felt like could impress Fritz, which is obviously a big part of the story. But right. also another big part of the story, I think, which is I feel is kind of like brushed over, is the fact that it, for most of them, it was too much too soon. And they were like the biggest celebrities in Texas when they're all super duper young. Like when these guys started wrestling, they were like, you know, 19 in the early twenties and having all that fame and having, you know, having any women they wanted or having drugs offered to them all the time and having people, you know, wanting them to come to parties constantly, all that rock star lifestyle. I don't think they really captured. And no. maybe it's, and I thought there might be some more kind of rock star esque scenes in the movie um and i guess they decided to not do them i mean a few reasons maybe one they felt like that's got to have been done many times in other movies and two which is kind of my biggest criticism of the movie and i I guess we'll get into it as we talk but 
you know, you're trying to tell this whole life story of the Von Eriks in a two hour movie. And that's like, it's just not possible, is it? I mean, obviously they got to leave a lot of stuff out, but I did kind of feel like that was, I mean, I'm, you know, we're not summing up yet, but my, my biggest flaw, I think, or biggest um, uh, critique of the movie was the fact that, yeah, it's trying to tell this story that spans decades and decades within a two hour movie. And legit, the first thing I thought of after watching it, like I was thinking, dude, at first I thought this could be like a 10 show uh, or 10 part series on Netflix. But then I was like, no, think about it. This could be like two or three series on Netflix and could have been a really, really awesome um, story. And I felt like to put it into two hours, they had to brush over so much stuff into the point where a lot of it kind of felt rushed yeah. and it was hard a lot of the times to kind of really feel and sympathize for the characters because there wasn't too many opportunities to really, you know, tell the different characters arcs and stories without kind of rushing through it. I've heard you say that before about other films uh, and I tend not to agree with you and I prefer a, you know, a shorter two, two hour self-contained movie but this is one of the rare instances where i actually agree with you and think that it absolutely would have required some more breathing room and a series it would have made an excellent series absolutely well there's just so and, many stories about the so, yeah, i can think of I mean, already which i'm like she, literally that like, you could do so many episodes on so many different things that happen with and, them you know and we might as well say it now one of them isn't even in the movie at all like they're not yeah. even a character well yeah. we're gonna i guess well we we'll might get, as well get yeah. to it now but yeah chris um Chris Von Erich, he was the youngest brother of the Von Erichs. And it's funny because they kind of, I feel like, so they have Mike Von Erich in this movie and they kind of try to, they almost seem like they kind of tie Chris and Mike into the same character. Oh, into character. one character? Oh, okay. So Chris, basically, he was born later on. He was the youngest. And he was like five foot five, did not have the physique or the ability to be a professional wrestler whatsoever. Not only that, but he had like asthma and he had like brittle bone disease. Oh, okay. So he just couldn't, he did, you know, he just wasn't cut out to out be a wrestler. It. But I guess either he felt like he had to be a wrestler or Fritz made him be a wrestler or both. And he was trying to go out there and do it. And even, you know, even the fans knew just like, yeah. oh, this guy shouldn't be doing this. And then because of his condition, he broke bones really easily. I think he broke his arm in a match and he'd only wrestled for like a year or so. And which led to him killing himself. I believe he shot himself and poor Kevin mm. was the one that found mm. him. I think the yeah. story is that he, he maybe Kevin came home, found a note, went out to find uh, Chris. So went to find Chris found Chris spoke to him and, and he's like, you're not going to do anything stupid. Are you? And Chris is like, no, don't worry blah blah. Then he left. Then he ended up killing himself. So like, obviously another tragedy. And it's, it's that's, I think to leave him out, I was reading some interviews and I guess the director, you know, he, I guess originally Chris was in the script. He was in the script for like five years and they ultimately decided to take him out because I don't know if they felt like they couldn't have too many tragedies, like one after the other. Again, we're saying like they're trying to cram this whole story into two decades. But is that not a big part of the whole thing? The fact that there was six Von Eric brothers and five of them died before the father died. Right. So to yeah. leave one out, I just, I don't know. I felt like it was an odd choice. Another thing I thought was kind of odd, and maybe I'm wrong here, but so towards the, the beginning of the movie, Kevin meets Pam, who's going to end up being his mm -hmm, mm -hmm. girlfriend and later wife. And he reveals to her that he'd had an older brother that passed away when he was six. And I forget the Von Eric's, the kid's name, was it Jack something I want to say? Jack, yeah. And Jack had uh, electrocuted himself and then fell and drowned in the snow. So just awful, awful tragedy. But mm. he speaks about it here. And he says here about the von eric uh curse family curse yeah and this is before all the other brothers had passed away and he says oh there's a curse because this was something like this was my mother's name or 
auntie's name or something. Grandma, yeah. Grandma's name. And we feel like that the name is cursed because she had a bunch of problems or something. I don't think that's true whatsoever. Like the Von Eric, the the sort of talk of a Von Eric curse didn't come about until obviously after quite a few of these tragedies. But I feel like they wanted to introduce that theme of a curse early on in the movie to have a kind of running theme and running narrative throughout the movie. So that was the way they tried to introduce it, where they kind of suggest that there's a curse even before any of the real tragedies take place. Where Realistically, it wasn't really a thing what was kind of discussed or even brought up until like way later on. Yeah. That, Another one of those kind of artistic liberties. They want to get the idea out early. It was, think about it now, that is kind of, if you're on a date with someone and at the diner and something tragic and terrible happened once when you were a kid and you just start talking how your family is cursed, you, like you wouldn't do that. <laughs> right. Like that, that's just not very natural, is it? Like that kind of, so there were some, we'll get into it, but a lot of the writing, like there were issues, I mm-hmm. think. Like mm-hmm. the, this is a messy movie. It had some, it's got some real good in it, some real bad, and we, we should probably just get onto those now. But now you've brought up Pam, another. I thought she was a pretty good. She was a strong character. I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I thought the best two characters actually were uh, Fritz and Pam. Mm, yeah, I feel like the mum was pretty solid too, though. The so mum was solid, me, but she didn't really have much to do. She didn't. You're right, but I like that. Like when she's there, she's there, you know, she yes. didn't waste any screen time. She wasn't in it a lot, but when she was, she was powerful, which I liked. I thought that was really good. Should we, should we move on then? Because there's some good scenes with both of those people in coming up very soon. Well, so we see Kevin, he obviously has mm-hmm. the desire to make it big in professional wrestling. And the narrative of this whole deal is that Fritz was one of the biggest stars in professional wrestling. I think he was AWA world champion, but, he never became the NWA World Heavyweight Champion. And that was the title that eluded him. And so basically he wanted his sons, or at least one of them, to become NWA Pick up the mantle, yeah, World Heavyweight Champion um, to bring the belt to the family. So that's kind of like the narrative of the story. And that's, you know, what Kevin wants to do. And it seems like more so to, you know, for his father and to oppress his father more than anything else. Like the story is yeah. very clear that the kids were all kind of fighting for their fathers yeah it's heavily implied that since a very early time the kids have been conditioned to live for their father's dream yes right yes yeah and um in this so fritz tells kevin that he's having the opportunity to wrestle the nwa world heavyweight champion harley race yeah but it's going to be a non-title match but he's bidding it up saying listen if you have a good showing with him then it can lead to rematches where the title is on the line. Yeah. And this bit I thought was interesting because they kind of almost at this point, I was thinking like, Oh, are they kind of suggesting that that wrestling is a shoot? It kind of felt like they were doing that for a second. It was like, Oh, if you can have a good match with him in a non-title match, then you you'll get a rematch for the title. Yeah. Wrestlers wouldn't really speak like that. I feel, you know what I mean? Like it'd be more like, okay, you got this match with him. You know, if it goes well, then hopefully you could do a program with Harley for the championship. Do you know what I mean? Rather than they were saying, like, you'll get a rematch for the title, then then you could win the world title. I don't know, it seemed a little odd to me. I, I, I read that almost as if the dad is coaching, not like wrestling coaching, but almost like grooming his son. Does that make sense? Like, well, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So like it, telling him something that he'd want to believe. Right, but it, it, the way I'm saying it, it, they almost kind of went into it like, they were almost treating it like a shoot, I felt. You know what I mean? Like he I really feel was like trying dad... to win world, the world title. Like that's not how wrestlers speak. Do you know what I mean? No, no. But I felt like the dad was treats it like a shoot to his son. Right. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Um, because even but... in this, even in the scene when, when Kevin does wrestle Harley, uh, all, you know, we get all these sort of close-ups. And at one point, Harley's kind of getting on big at on Kevin. And I almost felt like, oh dear, like, are they trying to, I'm like, again, it crossed my mind. Like, oh, they're kind of treating this again a bit like it's a a shoot. Like this has happened in wrestling movies before where like Mm -hmm. they can't really work out if they want to portray wrestling as a work or as a shoot. 
um, you know, at this point he gets kicked in the stomach uh, from Harley and he's like really hurt, hurt. And he gets slammed on the floor and he's like, hurt, yeah, hurt. yeah, I like, yeah. I was like, oh, are they trying to portray this like as real? And then they kind of, they, they covered up for it because I think afterwards they had Harley talk to him or something like that. Um, but the, the actual wrestling scenes, I've seen a lot of people uh, really put over the wrestling scenes. We know that Chava Guerrero was instrumental in like kind of doing all the, you know, the stunt guidance and stuff for this. Um, this might be a co- controversial take, but I felt like <sighs> quite a handful of the wrestling, in particular, a lot of the punches, I felt like looked pretty fake. And I couldn't tell if they looked fake because the actor or wrestler, whoever was doing them, was trying to make them look real, but looked fake. Or I couldn't tell if that was the case, like they just weren't very good at making them look good. Or if they would deliberately try to make it look like a work. Does that make sense? So, yeah, I know what the issue is. I I picked up on that as well. And I, fi- I think I figured it out. Now, spoiler alert for later on, Kevin faces Ric Flair. And there's a shot in that where he just kicks Ric Flair in the face. Now, in wrestling, that wouldn't happen. Just like, just he's on the floor and just kicks him in the face. Now, that was filmed like a movie kick, you know, where mm-hmm. you've got the back of the person's head and they just bring the leg across and then they act. Now, that's why they're, a lot of the wrestling shots were filmed like a movie fight. No, no, I and don't they think they were. Movie. That's why I. Well, that's they were, why... No, they, like, that's, that's my problem with the strikes was it was like the back of someone's head and they just like laid out a legit punch like how they would in an action movie. But in wrestling, that wouldn't happen. Oh, well, you're completely going against what I, there was spots like that. But what I'm saying, there was a lot of ones I thought that were, that, especially the like punches that looked particularly fake. And I could only assume that was sort of artistically done because obviously if they wanted a punch to look real, they can make it look real in with a movie, obviously, like you said, that film it like a, like an action movie. Do you know what I mean? But there was a lot of times where I thought it looked like pretty fake looking, I thought. And I'm guessing that was deliberate to make it look like a work. Obviously, they didn't want to film it and make it look like a real fight. I don't agree with you on that because a lot of times they did. To me. At some points they did, but there was a lot of points where they were doing stuff that did, like especially like the like I said, the punches I, or the ground. If that happened, like, I didn't notice it in the Harley race fight. By the way, just real quick while we're on this, who was your favorite non Von Eric wrestler? Um, because for me, it was Harley Race. Really, I didn't think. Yeah, race I thought he looked, looked good at all. Are you serious? Oh mm-hmm. wow. Okay. Honestly, I, I didn't. Honestly, wow. Out of all the extras, I thought. I didn't think, I don't know if he was supposed to be the Sheik Sheik, but I, I did think Chavo looked good at the start. And um, most, the majority of the other wrestlers, none of them really, I didn't think, looked that close to the characters. The one I thought was probably best was um, Terry Gordy the, in the Fabulous Freebirds. And he was actually played by an NWA, NWA wrestler called Frill Billy Mason, I want to say. You would know him. Um, and I, for some reason, I thought, oh, that looks kind of believable. But I will say this. The the guy that played, could they not have got a better person to play Ric Flair? Oh, because, okay. dude, here's the thing, right? I get that you're not going to get someone that looks just like them. But pretty much anyone who's a wrestling fan can do a Ric Flair impression, right? This guy was doing the Ric Flair long promo and just didn't sound anything like rick flair and didn't deliver it any way or type or, or form like rick flair whatsoever that and i found walk. really quite bizarre the walk as well during the match yeah why he why was he rick flair i don't know i don't know that one <clears throat> that was an interesting one but you're right like how do you uh, okay let, let's just take this point to talk about this now a lot of basically most of the actors did not look or act like the real life counterparts. The biggest offender is Kerry. So, yeah. So again, it's a movie. So yep. we understand that obviously the characters, you know, they're not going to look spot on like they did right. in real life. Um, a few issues that I did have. So, like I said before, I thought Fritz was like really yes. actually pretty spot on and was good. The man that played Kerry Von Eric, it was Jeremy Allen White. 
Mm-hmm. I've he did actually because so like they're not going to be able to find someone that looks like bloody Kerry Von Erich because he just looks right. so completely out there and different. Yep. Facially, Jeremy Allen White actually I felt like did have some similarities to Kerry Von Erich, but I also felt like the way that he carried himself in the movie wasn't really like Kerry Von Erich. And the whole point of the Von Erich brothers is obviously, yes, they were all brothers and they all wrestled, but they all kind of offered something different. So like Kerry was the star and the physique, right? The body. Then you Mm -hmm. had Kevin, who was the athlete. And then you had David who had the height and he was like the best worker and best promo. Um, So, it, to me, that's a vital part of the story. The fact that Ke- Kerry was the most jacked. But in this movie, Zach Efron, who's playing Kevin, is by far the most mm. jacked. So when yeah. in the movie, when Kerry is kind of getting one up over Kevin, it doesn't really make as much sense because Kevin, who's played by Zach Efron, is like the best looking and the most jacked. And right. to be honest with you, watching the movie, I felt like Zac Efron should have played Kerry Von Erich and Jeremy Allen White maybe should have played Kevin. I felt like that maybe would have fit better personally, because like I said, Zac Efron, he clearly was like, Oh, I'm going to play a wrestler in a movie. I've got to get the most jacked possible when in reality, like Kevin was at one point pretty jacked but for the majority of the time he was uh, much slimmer than Kerry. And I feel like the physiques that Zac Efron has had in previous movies, uh, in particular, like uh, Baywatch, Baywatch, his physique was more fitting for Kevin, Kevin yeah. Von Erich than the physique yeah. that he had uh, in this movie. And I don't want to take anything away from Zac Efron's physique in this movie because right. he clearly looked fantastic. But I don't think it was the most ideal physique for the role. Again, he clearly just thought, I want to get as jacked as possible. I'm playing a wrestler. And that that does help, I think, with a movie. Like, that's a good talking point. When someone gets, you've seen it a million times, when someone gets in an insane shape and insane jacked for a movie, it gets people talking. It makes headlines. So it completely makes sense. But like I said, for me personally, I feel like Efron would have fit Kerry Von Erich much better. And I dare say that Jeremy maybe would have played a better Kevin. Also, I'm not really familiar with any of the actors in this movie okay. other than Zach Efron. I know this Jeremy Allen White, he was in Shameless, but the American one, so I never saw it at all. Um, but yeah, that uh, that I felt like was something that could have been changed. I don't think I've heard anyone have that opinion, but it's totally valid. Like I agree with you on that. I didn't really think about it. I would say also, I think that Kerry Von Erich is quite a good looking man, and with love, Jeremy Allen White looks like Rodney Dangerfield, you know, in the, in the face. And right. I would, yes, I feel like swapping them around because also Jeremy Allen White is a way better actor than Zac Efron. So if anyone can like carry the the full length of the movie, I feel like this movie was messy. It has a lot of problems, but that switch would have solved one major one at least. I am going to agree with you. But would the movie sell as many tickets if no. Efron wasn't of there? Not. That's the problem. So I, I'm i a fan of Zac Efron to a degree, but maybe I'm more of a fan of Zac Efron just as a personality and a person, maybe more than his actual acting skills. Because I felt like, so obviously he's the main protagonist in this movie. And I felt like he did well to a degree but it, to me, he just seemed like he kind of had one level. And whilst I was watching it, I was thinking, dude, this is like one of the biggest tragedies of all time, right? right. I thought this movie, I was going to be crying every two minutes. And I kind of wanted to, do you know what I mean? I, I thought this was going to be the biggest yeah, tear yeah, jerk yeah. of all tear time. Jerker, yeah. And I'll be honest with you, I <laughs> disappointingly, I didn't cry once in the whole entire movie. And I felt like that's because we didn't have a deep enough connection with the characters. And I don't know if that was down to poor acting or just the fact that they rushed for it, but I don't think Efron, I I didn't think his acting ability was 
good enough to make me really care and believe and get sucked into the story. So I, yeah, I don't think, I feel like Efron, the fact that he wanted to do this movie, I think is freaking awesome. And obviously it gave a lot of attention to it, but overall I thought his performance was all right. But going into this, I thought the reason why Efron agreed to do this movie is because he wanted to do like a, a tragedy movie or a tragic movie which would end up getting him an oscar do you know what i right. mean you said and, that on when we went over the trailer it's yes sure. yeah you said the exact I same yeah don't think he achieved that in the, i don't think this was like a groundbreaking role for f1 no, no. so and it could have been well yeah the the issue is so jeremy allen white has a way bigger emotional like range mm -hmm. zach like capped out with his like acting ability you know it like he was good but he capped out. And mm. I do feel like swapping, like we said, would have would have done the movie like a lot more justice. We, you mentioned David though, and his promo work and in-ring work in real life. I feel like David, they did a very good job of portraying in this movie. So going back to that, after the Harley race match was my favorite scene in the movie because you see Kevin, like he's like, super frustrated you he won the match by disqualification right yes yeah, sorry i should have mentioned he he won but via disqualification and he just had like did a just a real rough shot of it you see his frustration it cuts to the his dad in the back fritz in the back who's just like clearly disappointed and then david runs in and tries to save it with like a killer off the cuff promo and you just like just that scene alone with no speaking, well, David's promo, but with no talking, it shows like the dynamic of those three characters who are central very well. And it shows their characters and like their relationship to each other. And I feel like David was the best, maybe the best cast. What do you reckon? I don't actually know who the actor is, but David, I, I seem to gel with. What about you? Harris Dickinson, apparently. Yeah, um, no, I haven't seen him in anything. Yeah, well, apparently, you know, in real life, apparently David kind of had the most sort of, was the most outgoing and kind of had the most personality. Most charisma, yeah. Yeah, and the most charisma. And I felt like they portrayed that pretty well in, in the movie I thought. And obviously that scene that you're talking about, that was set up very early on in the movie where they showed, this scene I did actually quite like, they showed... Zac Efron or sorry, Kevin Von Eric doing like a pre-tape where he's doing an interview and he just can't get it oh, right. He can't yeah, get his he words out. He repeatedly bullses it up. And Which I think is, Zac Efron did a really good job of that scene. Yes. That, like that, portraying the like his own frustration with his, his self, like with his, right. his abilities. Yeah. And we, and we see David there watching and then kind of giggling and Kevin getting angry and being like, well, if you think it's so easy, you do it. Which obviously set up for him later when he took yeah. the mic from Kevin and, and then says i thought i was promo. helping yeah right 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 so uh, they definitely do a good again this is all about just building that story of the brothers kind of having to compete for their dad's love over each other um so yeah again i i did think that the, the david character was good but again it just felt like we didn't really get to see enough of him to really connect with him do you know what i mean do you, do you think the story or the movie sorry did a good enough job of showing the the love that the brothers had for each other yes or no yeah i did you did for the for what we had which was two hours mm -hmm. i feel like the bond with the brothers was pretty strong and pretty good could it have been better if it was dragged out into a series like you said earlier absolutely but i feel mm -hmm. like with what we had that was one of the stronger parts i feel like they that they managed to achieve the best what about you Sounds like maybe you're not too sure. Um, no, I think they did. I think they did a good job of showing how much the brothers loved each other. Yeah. But I also, I don't know if they showed like enough scenes of them, like having camaraderie and like, again, I, I felt like, I feel like maybe there needs to be more scenes of them being, you know, dragged out of arena and people all over them and them kind of being with each yeah. other being like, Oh, this is crazy. Or like, or the, or the partying that they did. Um, you know, so again, I'll ask you this question as well. So a big kind of dynamic of the Von Erich family, which ultimately led to the kind of downfall was that, you know, they were so popular in Dallas and they had this kind of, they portrayed this squeaky clean family, like good, you know, all American boys, you know, good Christian boys, everything else. And 
Fritz, because wrestling was so big and popular, Fritz had kind of like a lot of kind of power over the city. And when his boys kept getting in trouble, he would always be able to bail them bail out. Them out. Mm. You know, they'd get arrested for something and he, you know, managed to speak to someone to get them out, whatever it might be, and cover it up most of the time. And I don't know if they told, I don't think they told that story well enough. Like, I'm trying not to jump ahead here, but there was just so there was like one tragedy after the other, after the other. And with each one, the audience just completely lost faith in the Von Erics and that, mm. and, the, and just the Dallas ter- territory as a whole. And that basically led to essentially world-class going out of business. But I think it's because they portrayed such a story of like, Oh, these are such great guys and blah, blah, blah. So when it started coming out about things like drugs and being arrested, and then obviously the, the, can I say the word suicides that, you know, really, really hurt the business and you could argue the legacy at least at the time of the Von Erics and everyone lost kind of faith in them. And it wasn't just those things either. So I hope I'm not jumping ahead, but when David passes away, when David dies, you know, they, they get a call from Japan. He died in his hotel room in Japan in real life. After that happened, you know, I think a lot of people know this, but Fritz, he, he felt like we need to replace David. And they had the idea of bringing in, a fake von Eric and claiming it was the the fake brother you mentioned earlier, Waldo von Eric. It was supposed to be his son, Lance von Eric, and I think his real name was something like Lance Vaughn or something. Um, but they bought they brought him in as a von Eric, and instantly just the crowd knew that he right, wasn't a, yeah, a real yeah. von Eric. Was an and, yeah. and like Kevin was really against it, but like that again actually really hurt the credibility. Yeah, and. Yeah it really hurt with the audience, like them doing things like that. And obviously when, again, I'm jumping ahead, but when Mike died, sorry, when Mike ends up breaking his shoulder and he goes to surgery, then post-surgery, he ends up getting, what is it? System shock syndrome. Oh, like toxic, toxic, toxic shock syndrome. Yeah. Right. And so he, you know, and he's in a coma. Somehow he manages to get out of the coma. And then like a week later, they do a press conference with him where he's like completely out of it. Um, people in real life assume that he had brain damage, but they do a right. press conference with him where he's like googly eyed, slurring his words. And he's like, I'm going to come back better than ever. And that was very uncomfortable for people. And that, you know, again, was another hit where the audience kind of lost faith with the family. So it kind of just felt like, you know, they talk about the curse. It was just one thing after the other that really killed the business in Dallas. And again, I, don't know if the story told that that well they as the show goes on they show more wrestling scenes they do they just show like a smaller audience so i guess that was their way of kind of suggesting it so just to put things into perspective right when david von eric died you know it so you said about earlier this you know they did show how it was a big funeral um, yeah. but it, in real life apparently it said something like between like four and five thousand people turned up to the to the funeral where they mm-hmm. couldn't fit everyone in they had like people outside they had to put screens outside for people to watch it there was apparently like i, I want to say maybe there was like a hotline where like girls were ringing up crying like hundreds and hundreds of girls i think they they shut schools it was a massive deal and fritz ran the show what was it the parade of champions kind of the david von eric memorial show in the texas was it the texas stadium i believe and they got the attendance is, it depends where you read, like who you listen to, but let's say between like 32 and 42,000, I believe, which I think at the time was like the biggest audience, at least in Texas, if not the States or something. Mm-hmm. And then years later, when Mike died and Fritz tried to do a memorial show for him, like another parade of champions, the audience was like, I want to say 5,900 under 6,000. So yeah. you can just see how, just throughout the downward these, trajectory yeah. right all these different scandals and stuff just you know the fans just lost interest completely in the von erics i feel like the director did kind of want to lionize the von erics to a certain degree and kept some kind of mm, how do we put this not shocking but some kind of bad behavior left it out but mm-hmm. they did 
have that scene, the press conference with Michael, and it was super uncomfortable to watch. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad that they, I felt like that scene in particular, they did do a good job and they, sh- and it was good that they kept that in. Other than that, I feel like, yeah, I would agree with you. Um, there were some other really good scenes like that. So at Michael's, um, well, first of all, with all, in in the in the theater, you said to me, there's like 40, 50, maybe an hour of just like set up, and it was almost just like a von Eric biopic, loose, you know, that's debatable, but biopic. And you said something to the line of like, oh, they're gonna just have to kind of oh, what did you say, Martin? Stack up the tragedies. At like, the yeah, end. just like back at yeah, like just back backload all it. the tragedies, right? Yeah. And they actually did that. <laughs> right. And I was like, right. So like, yeah, and like right at the end, it was just like tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. And there was no breathing room and the pacing was really like affected. And but and that's another reason why it would have been better as a series. But those hit after hit after hit of tragedy, they were punctuated with some very well directed or well written scenes. Some of the best there was. So, for example, the mom played by Maura Tierney from ER. I thought she did a really good job. Mm. She um there was this scene where she's getting ready for yet another funeral. And she was just like struggling to put her dress on because she knew that everyone would recognize it. Like she doesn't even have time to like get a new funeral dress. And I never (laughs) thought of things like that. You know, that just showcases like how tragic this really is. And like a very kind of mundane kind of way, like just down to the dress. Like, Oh, I'm going to be seen on TV again in the same funeral dress. I thought that was amazing. There's also another part a bit later on, I think it was at Michael's funeral where Pam kind of realizes that she's not really like a true part of the family because she's the only one that can kind of bring herself to cry at a funeral, Mm. you know, where everyone else is like super stoic for Fritz and just like things like that was just really good. But at the same time, like you said, just the, the pacing just took such a weird turn and hit towards Mm -hmm. the end. It was almost, uh, I really do feel like breathing room was what this needed more so than more accurate casting or more this or more that it needed it needed time and it just wasn't afforded that well another thing that kind of i talked about you know the the sort of fans in dallas losing faith with the von erics another kind of scandal was there was a lot of like uncertainty on how david von eric died and the von erics always portrayed it as um that he had i want to say it was called it was like a disease it was something to do with his was it his intestines but or, in the movie it was yeah enteritis right they say it was enteritis i don't know if i'm saying that right um but that's what the Von erics always, always said how he died but there was a lot of suspicions that he died of an overdose and i guess the theory was that he was in japan and bruiser brody funny enough came in his room found him dead and like hid all the the pill Evidence. bottles yeah and it got to the point where i guess fritz said that he would show like the doctor's report of the autopsy to the press but he like never did which made people suspect that it was he may maybe an overdose but they just didn't want to get that out there um and that was like another thing that kind of you know lost faith with the audience i guess so like that obviously they just didn't have time to tell that and i feel right. like they didn't necessarily show i don't know if they showed the pressure um or the weight on the shoulders that the boys had in, in the sense that like everything they did was in the public eye. Mm. So like, I felt like it could have been quite there was good none to have of a that scene thinking it, about it now. There could have yeah. been a scene where it's like someone gets arrested for something and it's like, ah oh, sh- crap, like the newspaper's gonna find it or like the next day, you know, Fritz rings them up and it's like on the front page of the newspaper. That kind of because that was obviously a big part of the reason why a lot of these guys end up getting so depressed and you know it took their lives which is that pressure and just constantly being in the the public eye so yeah you're right though they they showcased a lot of them facing the pressure of the family particularly the dad and the name but never really the pressure of like outside you know issues or scrutiny you're absolutely right the only time i would say was that probably that michael um press conference scene where Kevin's mm-hmm. just kind of trying to coach, but he's pausing before he does. And he just seems like awkward on it, but yeah, you're absolutely right. So I feel like that is another example where they could have really had like a sub, like a theme, like that was just omitted from the movie and they could have established that. I was going to say expanded upon it, but it's not even in there. They could have established that in like a, in a multi-part series. Uh, it's quite funny. The, um, how the internet at least kind of made, 
a big deal about MJF being in the movie. And I was in it for three seconds. Right. I think like, I, cause I wondered at the time, I was like, why is AEW not made more of a bigger deal about like their champion being in like a major motion picture. And, um, but yeah, he was, uh, he was, I'm not just, I don't want to say he was just an extra cause it sounds like I'm taken away from him. Um, but he was an extra. When I, when I first heard like, Oh, he's playing Lance Von Eric. I was like, Oh, they including that in the, the, the movie. That's kind of interesting. But he was an extra, much like all the other guys that, you know, but even less than actually, because Flair yeah. and Grace were more um, highlighted. Um, so, yeah, I did think that was that so, was kind of funny how the, I don't know if they originally had, he was supposed to have a bigger part he, but, or if, if the internet just blew out of proportion. Like they heard that he, he was in, in the movie as an extra, but like, oh, he, they're pronounce, announcing it as like, he's in the movie. It's like, okay. Yeah, well, he was credited apparently as like his active producer, but you know, however much that is true, we don't know. But it was essentially a, a cameo. And I think that's fine. Because no, it is. Such a, like, um, how do we put this? I feel you, like if he it's was hard for him to be an extra. more than anything other than just like, he does his little, ooh, doing all the hamming up the faces just for like three seconds. If he was in it for anything else, it would have absolutely detracted from the movie by virtue of him being MGF. Right, yeah. Do about that. So I reckon they used him very well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like MGF could be an actor, but maybe not playing a wrestler because if he is, it's like you're just going to think of MGF, it's just not a, the character he's playing, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now we're kind of towards the end of the movie now. Should we talk about that scene? Well, Ugh. we can get into it. I just, I guess it's worth noting that so after Mike's death, they they kind of show Kevin going into depression. I don't know. Again, this felt a bit rushed over, and I don't know if they really portray kind of carries trials and tribulations enough like with his drug use and getting arrested because do they show this in the movie just kind of like change like yeah like his character right at the start they did see that you did see him snorting a line of coke like on his mm. first night after being a wrestler they kind of hit that in early but from that point until when he's on the road and things start going down for him not really so i don't know if they they told this well enough in the movie Uh, just remind me so in, you know, they show obviously him losing his leg in the motorbike yeah. accident, which in this movie they suggest is like the the night after he won, or no, the night that he won the world championship, which you know wasn't the case. Like I don't think he lost it to quite a few years later. I guess we should mention that as well. Like in the movie, they it's funny because they build up for a long time about wanting the NWA title in the family, but then when Kerry does win it, and even though he won it, and it, it didn't really feel genuine because it was kind of almost like david died so they out of good faith they put the belt on kerry which he only had for a month. in real life in real life yes yeah. um but in the movie they, they, they keep building about how important it is to have the world title in the family and then when kerry does win it i don't know if in the movie they make like a big enough deal out of it like you don't even really see him win it you see like the mum watching it on tv or whatever um but anyway Kerry, uh, he ends up having the accident in the motorbike, loses his leg. And then obviously, like, I don't, I don't know if they told the story well enough about him getting addicted to pain pills and everything else. But what happened in real life is that I guess he'd been arrested before for some kind of drug charges and he was on probation for like 10 years or something. And then he ended up having another incident where he got arrested, I want to say, for another drug charge. And because he'd broken his probation, he was looking at probably going to jail yeah. and before he you know had a chance to go to jail he killed himself and i don't think they really they didn't say that in the movie right that wasn't no no they just he was just like oh he depressed so he killed himself but that was what happened in uh in real life so another thing they kind of i, I feel like a big part of the the story that they missed out and again i understand but i guess Every point I'm making just keeps going back to the fact like, yeah, this should have been like a 20 part <laughs> series. Um, but yeah, Kerry kills himself. And then um, yeah. that goes into this heaven scene. So, okay. So the movie is grounded from start to finish. I would say, would you? Yes. agree. They may be loosey goosey with the real life story, but as just like the style of the movie, it's realistic. Now, Kerry kills himself and Kevin finds him. And it sounds like from what you were saying about Chris earlier, that they may have kind of taken some elements of that. Yeah. So Kerry death when Kerry killed himself, I want to say Fritz found him, not 
Okay. Not, not Kevin. Kevin found Chris. In the movie, though, Kevin finds Kerry on the lawn, dead of the family house, or and Fritz comes there as well. There's this scene where Kevin and Fritz have a physical fight over who is responsible for the death of Kerry. And it's like the body's still warm on the on the lawn at while these two are just more focused on it was your fault. No, it's your fault. And I thought that was very good and very powerful. Then he brings, after they finish fighting, he brings Kerry's body into the dining room table. And then all of a sudden, you see Kerry and he's alive. He has his foot back, his his leg, his real leg back, and he skips across the lawn. He gets in a boat and he rows over to Chris and, um, sorry, excuse me, Chris isn't, yeah, Chris isn't in it. Uh, David and Michael and little Jack. Now, it's apparently this was a dream that kevin had he told his sons like and they put it in the movie allegedly however this wasn't portrayed as a dream sequence it literally just happened it was portrayed from kerry's maybe unintentionally but this is how it was from kerry's point of view and it was like oh i'm happy now i'm okay now and to me honestly it glorified suicide seemed like oh okay here's the answer to your problems he's happy now he's with his brothers and it was incredibly jarring. It was surreal when the rest of the movie wasn't. And it wasn't in a shocking way. It was just very like jarring and poorly done. And I would probably say tasteless. What about you? Well, it did seem to, yeah. The idea was that he'd gone to heaven. Right. And now he's back with his brothers. But I think they do show Kevin reading the suicide note, which Kerry basically says, like, I've gone to go be with my brothers. brothers and then it goes yeah. to that scene where like he is with his brothers and he's like, all happy and they're all hugging like oh this is great um so yeah i felt like i don't think i was as offended by the um the scene as you but i didn't think it was a good scene um i i felt like it was very out of place and i I guess they were just trying to put like some kind of positive spin on this because like again this whole movie it's kind of like it's about the tragedies it's kind of like what how should we end it do you know what i mean like what's the best way to end this whole story maybe they should have kept it going to when the the, the von Eric's got inducted to the hall of fame i don't know it's 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 super duper difficult to say that yeah um yeah, but yeah this yeah this kind of being in uh heaven scene i just i think the main thing i thought it was weird is just because like you said like the whole film was grounded and like real life and true then all of a sudden we're seeing like this like fantasy scene or whatever um so yeah i i did think that was not the best and then that then it, transition gone sorry i was gonna say that seemed like very student screenplay mm. it seems like you know when we did film studies and media studies and we mm-hmm. had to sit and watch other people's attempts like that seems like something that would come up in that i was like oh my god that really took that honestly like that almost killed the movie for me I, maybe that seems extreme Mm-hmm. didn't seem like you had that, so much of that reaction, but I just thought it was very gimmicky and silly and gimmicky. tight and kind of embarrassing and mm-hmm. just didn't need to be in the movie. What what would have been cooler, I think, is maybe like maybe Kevin visiting their like tombstones or something and they're like lined up together and maybe he's mm-hmm. with Pam and the kids and maybe he says something like, oh, now they're together or something like that it would have maybe been more fitting maybe, you know? <laughs> It's diff- yeah it's and like you said it's kind of difficult like where do you start and stop something mm-hmm. like this? such a massive kind of arc and story and life multiple characters multiple moving parts so many things yes. happen where do you choose to go bang and bang mm-hmm. like, start mm-hmm. and stop so i understand that completely do you want to just speak a little bit on the actual fi- the literal final scene because i feel like this <laughs> final scene kind of bothered you as much as yeah the, the boat scene bothered me well the final scene was was <laughs> kevin playing with his two kids playing catch the ball or whatever. And I think Pam is out there as well. And then he starts crying and I thought his crying acting was not good. And for me, watching grown men cry always makes me cry. And this did not make me cry in the slightest. And he's got the two kids and they go, dad, why are you crying? And he says, Oh, because I haven't got any brothers anymore. They say, don't worry, dad, we'll be your brothers. And he's like, yay and what i thought was really bizarre about this well first of all i just thought the way that the kids spoke to him is not like how five or six year olds would talk to their dad but second of all right in the i want to say 
in the Dark Side of the Ring documentary, Kevin says this mm. line, and he also he apparently said it to a bunch of people. But the line that Kevin says in the Dark Side of the Ring documentary, he says, I used to have five brothers. Now I'm not even a brother, right? And I thought that's a very powerful line. That kind of sums it up big time, right? I used to have five brothers. Now I'm not even a brother. That's like, wow, that's insane, right? But the line they decided, they kind of borrowed that, but changed it to, I'm sad because I don't have any brothers anymore. And I was like, this, it just didn't so seem I'm, that I'm sad because I was a brother and now I'm not a brother anymore. Is that what they changed it to? Yeah. Yeah, which I, I didn't did... actually hate. Like, I didn't know the actual original um, mm -hmm. quote. I didn't watch The Dark Side of the Ring. Maybe I should. Sounds mm -hmm. like that's better than the Iron Claw. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, like that, the actual kind of dialogue there didn't bother me so much. I think you're spot on about... Now, is this the acting or the directing? Maybe it is the acting, but the entire emotional payoff for the character for, of Kevin like hinges on him finally being able to cry because the entire movie he's not allowed because he's under the thumb like of the patriarch mm. and then like they have that scene with Kerry where he finally like stands up to his dad and that's like the part where you're like okay Kevin's his own man now but, like for better or for worse he's now like released of those shackles and so now he's able to cry and it's like the entire kind of like emotional punchline of the movie and it just wasn't acted with like again I just feel like Fiction. it's his range yeah I just don't think he has the ability. And I, I'm not trying to be rude. I really like Zac Efron. But may, yeah, like I said, maybe if it was Jeremy Allen White instead or someone, like I feel like it would have been more of a more of a payoff. But you you were also right. The screenplay, the, the child's, the kid's dialogue was so unrealistic. And it mm -hmm. really, it's it just me out multiple that. factors take you out of that final scene that should have been the most powerful. I, I really feel like this movie should have had ideally multiple, but at least more than... But well, at least one, it should have really had some proper hysterical breakdowns, I think, where you just see someone just crying with agony because, you know, they must have went through agony with all these tragedies. And we never really got that, you know, we got like the teary eyed, like, oh, and I know the gimmick was that, like, they weren't allowed to cry or whatever. But I, there was, like I said, there was never a point in the movie where I was even really close to tears. And like, I just, I don't think we really, they didn't really capture, I don't think, the character's pain. In a frustration and pain. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, well, they tried a little bit. They tried. Harry, when he tried to walk finally, like for the first time mm -hmm. on his prosthetic. But he was just, it was almost like more that he's frustrated. You know, when you first get on a skateboard and you can't, yeah. you get frustrated. It was more, it felt more like that, that you can't mm -hmm. do a skill than just like built up this, my whole life I've been trying to, you know, be an Olympian that failed. Now I'm trying to serve my dad as, you know, take the mantle from him. And now this thing has happened. Like none of that was built up. It was, it just felt that was the closest we got to what you were talking about. And it kind of didn't hit the mark. Right. Uh, another thought that I just had was, so in, in the movie it's portrayed that, um, was it Doris? Is that Fritz? Mom? Yeah. 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 That she was with him to the end, but that wasn't the case. She actually did divorce him. I want to say after, Chris. maybe after mike died or one of the yeah one of them that died um she divorced fritz because she kind of blamed the kids deaths on fritz yeah and that seems like a vital part of the whole story and again they just didn't have time for it and they decided to tell the story differently where you know they were still together obviously just for artistic purposes and i think another thing as well they they show kevin having the two boys because mm -hmm even though he had two girls first and not two boys. Oh. Um, but I guess they did that. I'm guessing they did that because they wanted to show how Kevin was going to be a better father to the boys than his dad was, I'm guessing. Um, but yeah, so, so some things like that obviously were different. You know, now I'm just thinking about it. Do you know who like appearance wise would have played a good Kerry Von Eric? No. Matt Riddle. Kind of, yeah. Kind of, right? I can see, like, facially, yeah. And then he's got the long hair and he's, and he's pretty damn jacked, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, I feel like I he could have played him. Obviously, he's not an actor. <laughs> I will, yet, who knows? Now, I will say, Jeremy Allen White did do a good physical portrayal of the, like, the physical mannerisms of Kerry in the ring. You know when Kerry mm. gets, like, fired up and does that, like, full body, like, pop? 
Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He did that, and it was kind of spot on. So mm-hmm. he's obviously done a staggering amount of research on the on the real person, and that should be admired. But um, overall, hmm, there was uh, I've sounded very hard on this movie. Right, I, I was also very built. Like we were excited. How long I have think, we been excited? Since I think this is dropped? a problem. I was going into this movie and building it up like this movie was going to be a heartbreaking, groundbreaking movie, right. where it was just like it was. And I didn't think yeah. it was ground. It, it definitely wasn't groundbreaking. Maybe other people will watch it. If they don't know the Von Erich story already, the film might hit home a little harder because they'd be like, oh, wow, like this death and this death. Like, but if you already know the story, I felt like nothing really hit that hard in the movie. So like overall, what did I think of the movie? Uh, people have been asking me, like, what did you think of it? And my answer's been like, it was all right. Like, it wasn't a bad movie. They didn't make a mockery of wrestling or anything. It wasn't like really out there or bad. Um, and I sat there quite comfortably for the few hours and watched it. And I was engaged. Um, do I think it could have been much more and a lot better? Yes, absolutely. And was I expecting more? Clearly. Yeah, I'm in the same boat as you. Now, I've been hard on the writing and the directing, but there were actually, like I said, some some spots where it was very good. But then I just found this movie very messy, very uneven. I feel like I'm this person where I know enough about the Von Eriks to kind of be irked by the movie, how they, you know, how they handled the story, like you said. I'm, I'm just in that middle ground. If I didn't know anything about the Von Eriks, maybe I would have enjoyed it more. Now, I feel like, either camp whether you know about them or not there were some problems with the movie like i said some of the dialogue there's a scene where kevin and kerry are in the ring sparring with each other and it's like the first time kerry can kind of really do something on his prosthetic leg but the dialogue that zach efron is delivering was like a video game cutscene and just so flat Mm. and but there were other times where he was delivering so when he kept bungling that promo right at the start where he obviously can deliver a good like vocal performance and that that so that to me wasn't Zach Efron's fault that was the direction or maybe even the writing the dialogue was mm-hmm. kind of odd there and that type of thing whether you, it doesn't matter whether you know about the Von Erichs or not like that's just a screenplay issue and a, and a movie issue and there were issues there were points like that just throughout like these problems but then at the same time like I said there's some really great scenes I feel like the strength of the movie apart from like the look like the the as a period piece I think it was very good Mm. And some of the perform across the board, the performances were strong. Yeah, mm-hmm. from everyone, the mum, the dad, and Pam, I feel like were the standouts. Mm-hmm. But across the board, from everyone, they were very good. So if you like acting, I feel like you may enjoy this movie. Other than that, if you just want a family, a bleak family drama, if that's your thing, would you recommend it? A kind of. Uh, I feel like I would, but uh, let me ask you a question. Do you think there was like any standout, like? Was there any classic scenes in this? I don't think there's any there's any scenes that I need to be like, I need to go back and watch but, that again or like that will stand the yeah. test of time. But but not all movies need some like standout particular scene or set piece or anything. Again, this was more True. of like a family drama, and that's absolutely fine. Mm-hmm. But it's the movie was almost mundane. Yes. Now, and we're talking about the Von Eric. And like a mundane family drama is fine. Like, yeah, like there's really good ones. I can think of loads of really yeah. good ones, but we're talking about the Von Erics, right? Rock stars, you know, right? And <laughs> yeah. I feel like so we're stuck in this kind of middle ground. I, I, I'm not sure the movie had an identity in mm. that. Like it felt like they kind of wanted a cool Von Eric biopic, which would have been awesome, but also a tainted, sad family drama. And we're kind of stuck in the middle where neither one really shined. I right. feel like this movie is so average, like overall, some really good bits, kind of poor bits, you know, performances were solid, shoddy writing, good writing, shoddy direction, good direction, you know, like overall for me, it was very average. Yeah. Which, and, which, and David, oh. that we watched it with when it came out of the movie theater, I asked him, I was like, Oh, what do you think? And he was like, yeah, it was all right. You know what I mean? It seems like the, no one, I, I don't think anyone's seen this. Maybe they have, but like, I find it hard to imagine people being like, I was blown away by the movie because I was not mm. blown away at all. And I, and I guess 
I, I should hope based... somebody found that, you know, like I hope yeah. there's people out there who love, you know, where it hit home for them. Oh, well, I will say, can I just add, I don't know if this is a popular take, but I do feel like it was good to see some like good old fashioned masculinity on the big screen again, whether you decide that was like for the best or for the worst with the characters. I just thought it was kind of a good, like a nice fun thing to see. Like the dad what? character reminded me of the dad who's seen Brad Pitt in the tree of life. Yes. Yeah. Like that sort of, mm-hmm. you know, that sort of figure. I, I kind of, I like that sort of thing. Well, they and show masculinity, well but that's kind of the narrative of the movie. That it's the masculinity. It's a central is, theme. But it's the masculinity has led to the downfall of the family, really. That's kind of the story. It also itself. kind of defines Kevin, though, because remember the kid, again, I understand terrible dialogue coming from a kid, way too precocious, but like the kids were saying, well, actually, like, you know, we cry all the time. We're men. Like, it's it's not necessarily just all doom and gloom in regards to men. Right. It actually isn't. No, mm-hmm. it's, it's their downfall, but it also is what defines them and defines their legacy, I think. I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, I was going to ask you, so two questions. One, yep. would you recommend it? Mate, like, why have we, we've done this, this is our 25th episode, and this is the hardest kind of, out of five or would i recommend then like all of the pay-per-views that we've done (laughs) right we've we've come unstuck on a movie i i I, i'm gonna say it's like a watch once because people waste their time with worse and there is some good in this yeah Mm -hmm. for sure like it's undoubtable and just a follow-up question what was your star rating for this movie or what would you I was going to say, would you give it out of 10? But should we do the same as we do our wrestling shows? Yeah, I think a 2.5 stars, I think is absolutely fair. Yeah. Right in the middle. I was hoping, honestly, yeah. And that's annoying because I would actually probably rather this was trash. Right. Yeah. Because then we could laugh at, oh, this Zac Efron movie, he thinks he's going to get an Oscar. And it was just like so legendary. But no, like it was quite good. Mm-hmm. you know it, it's, i was really excited it, it nothing it didn't set me on fire it wasn't really really good it wasn't really really bad like it had some good moments and it had some rough ones and i didn't i'm gonna forget about this movie i mean yeah. we watched it yesterday and then we we're trying to come up with the synopsis before we hit record and we we're like what happened next like it's, <laughs> it's incredible and that's a, such a shame we're talking about the von erics here man <laughs> it is it is what about well- you yeah, I mean, you pretty much just covered all my thoughts exactly. I've, 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 I think I've said enough on the show. I was very, very excited for it. Um, if anything, I just hope that this movie inspires a TV show to come out of it. And I think it's probably unlikely, but fingers crossed. That would be my ultimate dream to get some kind of Netflix long ass series out of this and to really tell the Von Eric story, but um, overall glad that I watched it 2.5. I'd agree with. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess time will tell how it does at the box office and obviously we'll keep that up to date on the podcast. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I was, I was wondering if this is going to be one of those, Oh, if you're a wrestling fan, it's five stars. If you're not, it's one star or the other no. way around. But honestly, it's like, if you're a wrestling fan, you might like it. If you're not yeah. a wrestling fan, you might like it. Right. Like, exactly. Mm, exactly Shame. well glad i know, watched it still though you know for sure. watch it once i'd say watch it once well we could probably debate and talk about this all day but you know it's christmas yeah. time so we're gonna have to let you all get to the holidays uh mm-hmm. thank you so much to everyone that listened to the podcast today thank you if so you, much yeah if you enjoyed the show please subscribe please leave, a, leave us a five-star review that would really help the algorithm for the podcast and of that course that will be your christmas present to us that would be nice yes please give us it. a five-star review on apple podcast or whatever it is uh, and follow us on the social media accounts on uh we're on instagram youtube tiktok at the villain pod and uh yeah i think most importantly have a very merry christmas and a happy new year from the chillin with the villain team and thank you so much it's been Nearly six months, I want to say. This is episode 25 of the podcast, so nearly half a year of the podcast. So thank you to everyone that has supported us over the last six months. We was on this journey and ride of us, and we appreciate you all very much. And thank you so much for listening. All right, guys. Yep. Have a very happy holidays. Merry Christmas and have a good week. Till next week. 